we're very pleased to have Brian McClanahan with us. Brian has a PhD from the University of South Carolina. At least one of his books is for sale outside, and I'm sure he'd be happy to sign it to you. But I would say that he's right up there with Tom Woods in terms of someone who really understands the Constitution with all of its <coughs> good and bad, and really understands our founding period, and really <coughs> understands the nonsense that surrounds that founding period and that still permeates our society today. So, Brian, thanks so much for being with us today. So uh, I'm going to start today actually applying this to Texas. We're in Texas. So I'm going to start with a letter that everyone in Texas should know. If you don't know it, you should leave. To the people of Texas and all Americans in the world, Fellow citizens and compatriots, I am besieged by a thousand or more of the Mexicans under Santa Ana. I have sustained a continued bombardment and cannonade for 24 hours and am not lost to man. The enemy has demanded a surrender at discretion. Otherwise, the garrison are to be put to the sword if the fort is taken. I have answered that demand with a cannon shot, and our flag still waves proudly from the walls. I shall never surrender or retreat. Then I call on you in the name of liberty, of patriotism, and everything dear to the American character to come to our aid with all dispatch. The enemy is retrieving inf uh, receiving inf reinforcements daily, and we will no doubt increase to three or 4,000 in four or five days. If this call is neglected, I am determined to sustain myself as long as possible and die like a soldier who never forgets what is due to his own honor and that of his country. I'm sure everybody knows what the last line is. Anyone want to mention what it is? Victory or death? Alabamian William Barrett Travis. I had to throw that in there since I'm living in Alabama. <laughs> now, I begin with this letter not because of the situation and the, the, um, the violence at the Alamo, but because there's two parts of the letter that speak to this topic today. First, to all Americans in the world. He's not talking just to Texas. He's talking, speaking to all Americans in the world. And what was the issue? Independence. The American tradition, and thus it should be supported by Americans everywhere, whether you're in Texas or elsewhere, or somewhere else in, in the United States at the time. Americans have a distinctive history. There, of course, are examples of secession in classical history, mainly Greece, in relation to the Persian and Athenian empires, and again in the 16th century in regard to religion, the secession of the Protestant churches from the Catholic Church. But in the modern age, America really has established the method and set the example for others to follow. Remember, Jefferson's call in the Declaration of Independence, he said, we have a right and a duty as a free people to be able to alter or abolish our system of government. And this was based on traditional English liberties. But no one really had tried to do it until that point, until the American cause for independence in 1775. This is often incorrectly labeled an act of revolu revolution or rebellion, but Jefferson himself called it an act of secession later in his life, and he was correct. For in reality, the American War for Independence was a constitutional crisis in relation to the powers of the British central government. This was to prevent a revolution rather than have a revolution. The revolution was coming from the British center. They were trying to alter the Constitution. Americans had exercised almost exclusive jurisdiction over their local affairs since the founding of the first permanent colony in 1607. So when the Central Authority Parliament clamped down on the colonies after the French and Indian War, colonial leaders rejected parliamentary overreach and instead declared their independence in essence seceded from the British Constitution to preserve their liberty and right to self-determination and most importantly, self-government. So that's the first point. Americans everywhere should embrace this. Second, there's Travis's request in the name of liberty, of patriotism, and everything dear to the American character. What does that mean? Certainly, Texas believed it had a legal right to declare its independence in 1836. It was seceding from the Mexican Empire. Some would call this an act of revolution again, but the Texans asserted that it was the government in Mexico City that had caused a revolution. And I'll quote you from the 1836 Texas Declaration of Independence. When a government has ceased to protect the lives, liberty, and property of the people, from whom its legitimate powers are derived, and for the advancement of whose happiness it was instituted, and so far from being a guarantee for the enjoyment of those inestimable and inalienable rights, becomes an instrument in the hands of the evil rulers for their oppression, 
when the federal republican constitution of their country, which they have sworn to support, no longer has a substantial existence, and the whole nature of their government has been forcibly changed, without their consent, from a restricted federated republic composed of sovereign states to a consolidated central military despotism in which every interest is disregarded but that of the army and the priesthood, both the eternal enemies of civil liberty, the ever-ready minions of power, and the usual instruments of tyrants, it thus became the right of their people to alter or to abolish that government and institute a new government. So the American character Travis refers to is its opposition to these transgressions and the right of self-determination. We would call that liberty. Texas then gained its independence in 1836, claiming it had a right to do so because of the American origin of its inhabitants. It was an independent political entity for nine years. It agreed to enter the Union in 1845 on equal footing with the other states. At least that had been the American tradition. But the people of Texas never relinquished their sovereignty. Sovereignty cannot be divided or surrendered. You either have it or you don't. Sovereignty can be delegated, but a delegation assumes the ability to rescind that power. And I often use an analogy with my students. Say I gave them the ability to grade their own tests, and they're all going to come back A's. So then I could override those grades because I have the power to do so. I delegated that authority. John C. Calhoun said the divided sovereignty was like half a triangle or half a square. They don't exist. Half sovereignty is the same. So when Texas acceded to the Union, and thus by logical deduction, they could secede from the Union by popular will, and they did so in 1861. Which brings me to another important part of Texas history, the famous or infamous case, Supreme Court decision of Texas v. White in 1869. This case is almost universally used as an argument against the legality of secession. And in fact, this was brought up several years ago. I was at another conference um, in Florida. And somebody stood up at the Q&A and said, well, Dr. McClanahan, you say all these things, but, you know, the Supreme Court decided in 1869 that secession was illegal. And my response was, so what? Amen! <laughs> I wasn't trying to be flippant. But of course the Supreme Court was going to argue against secession. They're going to say it's unconstitutional. Why wouldn't they? This is 1869. The United States had just waged a war for four years to prevent it. So to do otherwise would be saying, whoops, um, sorry, uh, South, you were right. Uh, you, you lost, but you were right to begin with. They're not going to do that. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court at the time, Salmon P. Chase, who was a Lincoln appointee, said in the decision, the union between Texas and the other states was, a, was as complete, as perpetual, as indissoluble as a union between the original states. There was no place for reconsideration or revocation except through revolution or through consent of the states. So he bases his reasoning on the one people national, nationalist argument made famous by Joseph Story and his commentaries on the Constitution, but advanced by every nationalist from 1787 forward. There's a great political theorist named Albert Taylor Bledsoe who humorously called this the great political discovery of Abraham Lincoln. He just was searching and he discovered this out of thin air. So is secession legal? I've argued extensively that it is. There are several ways to approach the argument and to refute the Hamilton Marshall story, Lincoln nationalist lie that secession is illegal and treason. Secession as accomplished by the Southern states in 1860 and 61, and as discussed over and over again in the North, in fact, first in the North, is an independent act by the people of the states and accomplished in the same fashion as the several conventions that occurred throughout early American history. The United States would never be a party to a lawsuit on the issue because secession, both de facto and de jure, is an act of self-determination. And once the states have seceded from the Union, the Constitution is no longer enforced in regard to the seceded political body. The same rule applies to Article 1, Section 10, argument against secession. Article 1, Section 10 says the states can't form confederations. Well, if the Constitution is no longer enforced, the states have separated and resumed their independent status, then the Supreme Court would not have jurisdiction and therefore could not determine the legality of the move. The Union then, of course, could declare war or could attempt to force the seceded states to remain. But even victorious, this has not solved the philosophical issue. It never has. War and violence do not and cannot crush the natural right of self-determination. It can muddle the picture and force the vanquished into submission so long as the boot is firmly planted on their collective throats. But a bloody nose and a prostrate people settles nothing. 
Oliver Ellsworth of Connecticut said in 1788 that he feared a coercion of arms in relation to a delinquent state. He said this, this constitution does not attempt to coerce sovereign bodies, states, and their political capacity. No coercion is applicable to such bodies, but that of armed, an armed force. If we, did, if we should attempt to execute the laws of the Union by sending an armed force against a delinquent state, it would involve the good and the bad, the innocent and the guilty, in the same calamity. So Ellsworth recognized, as did the majority of the founding generation, that force did not destroy sovereignty. It created artificial supremacy, but sovereignty, the basic tenet of the founding, could not be surrendered in such a manner. And of course, what we must also emphasize is that an act of war also destroys Republican government. Maryland said as much in 1861. They formed a committee and, and uh, issued a report about the crisis of 1861. This is what the report said. Subjugated provinces could not be sister states and a federal government professedly Republican maintaining the authority by armies could not be other than the worst and most unprincipled and uncontrollable of despotisms. The South has entrenched itself upon the principle of self-government, has offered to negotiate peaceably and honorably upon all matters of common property and divided interests, claiming only that three millions of people had a right to throw off a government by which they no longer desired to be ruled and to live under no other government of, and to live under a government of their own choosing. Unless the American Revolution was a crime, the Declaration of Independence is falsehood, and every patriot and hero of 1776 a traitor, the South was right and the North was wrong upon that issue. In the Texas v. White decision, Justice Chase implicitly recognized that the Union was an indissoluble contract between the American people and the federal government, or in this case, the people of Texas and the federal government. All contracts are intended to be pet perpetual. But if this was the case, how could nine states ratify a new constitution while four states remain part of another union in clear violation of the language of the Articles of Confederation? Changes to the Articles required the consent of all 13 states, not nine, and thus the Constitution can be viewed in part as an act of secession. Moreover, James Madison argued that the Union was a different type of contract. He said, I quote, We are not to consider the Federal Union as analogous to the social compact of individuals. For if it were, a majority would have the right to bind the rest and even to form a new Constitution for the whole. The Constitution was framed by the unanimous consent of the states present in the convention assembled in Philadelphia, but it had no teeth until the states in convention ratified it. Even at that point, Madison suggested the states could not bind the rest into accepting the document or remaining in the Union. The Constitution does not have a coercive principle, as Ellsworth called it. An indissoluble Union would suggest that it does, and it doesn't. Waging war against them, the states, which is from the Constitution, is an act of treason. As So a state can be protected by the central government on the application of the legislature or the executive in case of invasion, but Lincoln had neither. Lincoln violated both the constitutional safeguards against coercion by the central government in 1861, of course, only if the states remained in the Union, as he insisted they did. So if he didn't have that authority, then war would have been required from Congress, which something Lincoln did not have either. He didn't have a declaration of war. And if he did have a declaration of war, then Congress would have to recognize the Confederate states as a legitimate government. Either way, Lincoln violated the Constitution, thus rendering the bloody nose argument again against secession void. Now, this one people argument against uh, secession was dissected by John Taylor of Caroline, a great uh, political uh, philosopher from Virginia in his new views on the Constitution of the United States. Taylor contended that continuity between the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution reinforced the sovereignty of the states. This is an interesting argument. So because the Articles of Confederation was there and we had this Constitution, it's just a more perfect union, a union of what? States. And he said this, this is a wonderful quote, there are many states in America, but no state of America, nor any people of an American state. A Constitution for America or Americans would there have been similar to a constitution for utopia or utopians? This is in sharp contrast to Chase, who argued that continuity maintained perpetual union. Taylor said, the, the, this construction bestows the same meaning upon the same words that are three constituent or elemental in, instruments and exhibits the reason why the whole language of the constitution is a, uh, financed to the idea of a league between sovereign states and hostile to that of a consolidated nation. 
The text of the Constitution itself clearly states it is, a, it is an agreement or a compact between the states so ratifying the same, not the people in the federal government. That idea is a fabricated distortion of the Constitution and pure fiction. So a few parting words on the issue of secession as the American tradition. That is, after all, the title of my talk. Secession and liberty are synonymous. Secession is the greatest act of liberty. It is the right of self-determination and self-government. And I think we should always realize that and put it in those terms. It is not easy. Not everyone wants this type of liberty. And for most of human history, it's been violently opposed by the central authority. But there is hope. In 1991, several states seceded from the Soviet Union, and no tanks were sent in. So I think as young people look at this, they're starting to say, wow, the emperor has no clothes in Washington, D.C. They're starting to realize this. And so therefore, people are waking up to the idea of peaceful secession. But there's also individual acts of secession, as Jeff just related to, and they're happening every day in America, from homeschooling to community farming. It is a natural incl in inclination for independent people to have control over their own lives. This type of secession is important for political reasons, though. The founding generation were independent people, as were Texans in 1836. Independent thinkers who led independent lives are naturally drawn to political independence. They can't be bought or controlled. But we must not follow Thoreau's type of secession, simple removal from society, but John Randolph of Roanoke's insistence on saying no from a position of strength. Now, why could he do this? Because he could simply go back to his farm. We must lead independent lives, but remain politically involved with the sole intent of saying no. And of course, the best example will be the last speaker today, Dr. No. <clears throat> we can say this in the general government, that would be helpful, but we have to say it from state and local communities because that is the hedge against tyranny. If enough Americans make this choice, the choice to abide by Travis's call for all Americans in the world to action in the name of liberty, patriotism, and everything dear to the American character, we can and will achieve peaceful, peaceful success. Secession is the American tradition, and libertarians should and must help lead the way. Thank you very much.